the dreams evolve, the dreams evolve as, as do we, we grow. And then like we have different aspirations. So I think it's, it's awesome. Just like have any dream, you know, it's like, it, and ex- allow it to change. Like, you know, not to be so stubborn. It's like, well, that has to be it. It's like, it, it, it can take on a form. And as long as like you have that burning inside your heart to go in whatever direction that you did when that dream first came up, then, then I think you're fine. This is Love Your Work, and I'm David Cadavy. I'm here to help you find the clues that will lead you to your calling. Today's guest wanted his own travel show, so he got a camera and started traveling. At first, not much happened. Peter Bragiel just kept stowing the tapes away in a box. But eventually, his adventures got bigger, and his videos got better. He's traveled the entire Trans-Siberian Railway. He's canoed the entire Mississippi River, and he even rode a tiny scooter with a maximum speed of 29 miles an hour across the United States. Peter's adventures are released on his YouTube channel under the brand In Transit TV. And Peter makes a living off of these travel videos. He's worked with brands such as Range Rover and American Express and T-Mobile. He also learned Spanish using a Rosetta Stone as preparation for a sponsored trip to Cuba. He he ended up crashing a vintage car during the shoot. You're going to hear about that and what they did about it. This week's episode is a great story about making dreams happen. How did Peter finally get the courage to publish his videos? How does he plan bigger and bigger trips? Why did Peter, who worked as a runway model in Milan and an actor in Los Angeles, reject the gatekeepers and decide to choose himself? I can't help but feel after listening to this conversation that Peter and I are a lot alike. I'm I'm not a runway model, but in other ways. Anyway, it seems like he has always felt compelled to travel and make videos, even if it didn't immediately make sense. And I know that I'm always spending hours on things that don't immediately make sense. I especially liked learning about how things he writes in his journal years ago eventually come to light. And I think this is really important to be aware of. Your subconscious is always trying to tell you something about your destiny. So it pays to listen. Now, before we get to Peter Bregel, I want to ask you something. Do you remember the first time, the first time that somebody asked you to send them an invoice? An invoice? What is an invoice? That's what I said. I mean, that's what I said in my head out loud. I was like, oh, sure, I can definitely send you an invoice, whatever that is. Invoices still strike me as a strange word. Frankly, I don't get why we use that word. It doesn't have any grounding to any other word that I know. Like, why can't we just call it a bill? Is bill too literal? Like, do we just use invoice so clients don't know that they're actually getting billed? I don't know. It's one of those formal things that you have to do in the course of business. And as a creative person, I don't really like dealing with formalities like that. Fortunately, now there is FreshBooks. They make sending invoices really easy. You don't have to worry about getting all the right info on there because they help freelancers, consultants, and small businesses everywhere send millions of invoices. And they make it really easy to get paid. Like the furnished apartment that I live in actually sends me my invoice, sends me invoices with FreshBooks. And then they make it really easy to pay by credit card. So by the way, that's right. I pay my rent with a credit card. Hello, airline miles. Right now, FreshBooks is offering Love Your Work listeners a 30-day free trial. Send as many invoices as you want. Just go to cadavy.net slash FreshBooks to claim your free trial. That's cadavy.net slash FreshBooks for a 30-day free trial of FreshBooks. And now, Peter Bragiel. So I guess uh, to start off with, like, what kind of projects are you working on right now? Uh, so right now I'm actually in between like branded projects. Um, I might have some going on in the summer. So I'm focusing on some more passion projects, uh, stuff that I haven't really done for the, you know, in the past four years, which is really sort of how I got my channel going was just doing some of these like travel adventure uh, production. So I'm trying to refocus and just do something fun that I've been meaning to do for a long time where I'm not so worried about brand involvement or, you know, getting things green lit. It's really just going with my gut instinct and, and, uh, and producing something. So I'm pretty much in a pre-production stage right now for, um, one of two trips. So that's, that's kind of where I'm 
I'm at right now. Just doing a lot of research online and uh, a lot of thinking. So, th- I mean, do you find it valuable then to kind of take away some of the structure from time to time? Is that kind of what you're doing? Absolutely. Yeah. Well said. Um, yeah, I, it's nice to remove the structure because I started with zero structure. And I think because of that, companies that worked with me want to attach themselves to some of my, my projects or style of work. Uh, but then once I got involved in kind of that branded world, um, you know, I, I lost a little bit of, of that free thinking, uh, free flowing content creation was focused on, uh, not necessarily selling a product, but just selling a message. And when I had those two dialogues in my head, I'm just trying to balance of like being natural, being me, but also at the same time, like, okay, you're also doing this for somebody else and you're trying to promote something. So you always have that, like, I guess that, that voice in your head. And I think it's nice now just kind of get back to the roots and just figure out what my message, what my message is. Cause you know, when you start working with other companies, you're focusing on that and it's time to like, just reevaluate what, what, what's important to me. If that makes any sense. Yeah. I see this happening a lot with writing for myself. Uh, like I, I might be trying to sell a certain thing, but then there's a lot of writing that I do where I'm just really wandering and doing whatever I, whatever comes to mind that particular day. And then there's also polishing some of that so that it, a certain message gets across to the audience. And these are like different modes of operating in that all kind of feed into each other. Is that kind of how it works for you too? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's just more of an exercise for me to just like, to strip everything down and, and be creative and not have so many, I guess, parameters um, you know, and similar to writing, it's like, there's things that I want to do right now, but without funding or without, you know, getting approval from somebody, I, I just can't do them. So I'm trying to think about how I can do things with limitations. And that's where I think I become the most creative, um, is to just, you know, do with that, what, what I can within my own limitations, not someone else's. Yeah. And so, I mean, a bulk of the bulk of uh, your income and with your business is these branded projects where you're traveling, uh, going various places. Like what are some of the, the recent trips that you've done that were branded? Uh, so branded stuff. Okay. I did a road trip series with Land Rover, um, about four years ago, maybe that sort of started the whole branded adventure production process. Um, so yeah, we did, we drove two of their cars up and around the United States. It was like a 6,500 mile, uh, road trip up the California coast and then across the United States and then down to, uh, I think it's North Carolina. Uh, so I did that. And then, um, a sailing trip from, well, actually a boat trip from Florida to Cuba with Rosetta stone. So I studied Spanish for four months and then took what I learned and then traveled to Cuba by boat. Um, and then after that, Rosetta Stone and I did another trip where I rode a scooter the entire length of Italy from Lake Como down to Sicily. Um, outside of that, let's see what else have I done recently. I did some like hosting stuff with American Express last year around this time. Um, a trip with Boda Box Wine. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but it's like a box wine company. Uh, it's about like sustainability and just, you know, they use recyclable uh, products. And I traveled with them to Montana. Uh, did like a two part series with them, uh, did something with Verizon, no T-Mobile, T-Mobile. That was more hosting stuff. That was like commercial in the studio. Like, Hey, I'm Peter, I'm a traveler. And these are my tips on how to travel with, you know, travel the world with the data plan or whatever. So, um, a variety of projects, some adventure and also some just like in studio, uh, commercial style productions. So how do you think that maybe that, that Cuba trip might've been different if it were not a branded project, you know, what I love about working with Rosetta stone and is, is that I think our messages are very similar. They're very in line. I approached them a couple of years ago, pitching them a, a series. And I think the connection became very natural because I wasn't trying to sell bubble gum. I wasn't trying to sell a product that is, uh, dishonest to my brand speaking another language and traveling to another part of the world is, or learning a language and traveling to another part of the world and using that language is like core to what my series is all about. It's about when I say series, I mean like the content that I create on YouTube. It's about just like immersing yourself in a culture and like trying to, I don't want to say adapt, but just understand and be less of a spectator and just try to, understand a little bit of the culture more to be, and also to show a little bit of respect to where you're traveling in and around. So I think when I 
align myself with Rosetta Stone, selling that product was, was natural. You know, I didn't have to like think twice about it. It was really just like, cool, we're here. I'm speaking Spanish. There you go. That's, that's product placement. You know, I don't have to walk around with the yellow box while I'm in Cuba saying like, okay, this is, this program works like, cause it worked. It actually worked. I used the product and incorporating it into a series like that was, was simple. So in a situation like that, I think if it was, if it wasn't branded, um, I don't, I don't know what, like, because there were, there, there was like no structure necessary to that. I was like, go to Cuba and then like, just use your language, use, use your language skills. So I think in a lot of ways, if I were to go without Rosetta Stone, it would have been a very, very similar trip. Yeah. I crashed a car in Cuba and that's like, that's very off brand. I crashed a 1949 Chevy into the back of a bus and Rosetta Stone was like, Ooh, are you okay? All right. Is it okay if we use that footage? Like they were okay with that content. And that's like content that I'm very proud of. It's like, I mean, not that I couldn't drive a, a vintage car, but I'm proud of the fact that like it was raw, real, it wasn't touristy. It wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't predictable. And the fact that they were cool with that and they wanted to use that just showed me that they're a company that, you know, that's worth working with. So I think, yeah, to answer your question, if I were to go by myself, it, it'd be a similar trip because there's a certain edge to it that, um, that resonated with me and, and my style. It sounds like your values were aligned with them. Exactly. And like, I, I, how did you, how did you discover those values for yourself? That was, was that just through the process of making enough videos that you started to develop your own sense of what you believed about the world and how to experience travel and that, is that yeah, I, th- I think so. I think it's just like from living a life of, of travel, you know, I've been traveling a lot, you know, as a kid, uh, my parents would take us around the world, uh, whenever, whenever they had time off from work, my parents are immigrants, they're from Poland. So I think there's like a sense of respect being an immigrant family in the United States, like understanding how the rest of the world works, whether it's through travel or understanding how, uh, our family kind of behaved in the country and just that respect for, other people abroad and that it's not, you know, it's not America first all the time. You know, it's not like wherever you go, everybody speaks English. And I think a lot of travelers from America give the United States a bad rep because they go to a place assuming that everyone does speak English. And a lot of times people do, but I noticed that just from my trips, a lot of times I would attach myself or associate myself with being Polish before I was American. Um, just so that way I didn't have to put the pressure on somebody that they had to speak English to me. So I would try to speak their language. And I noticed that there's like a, there's a a sense of respect that people gave me, um, that which is reciprocated that allowed me to, uh, I don't know, just, just make me feel more comfortable as well as the people that I was, um, that I was meeting abroad. So I think carrying that over into video, I noticed that just like if I'm capturing content and somebody's in the frame or if I'm filming something, uh, it'd be, it'd be ignorant of me to go and approach that person in English and ask them if it's okay to film. So I'd memorize how to say like, is it okay to film you in that language? Uh, just to get kind of like a verbal release of some sorts. Uh, so I think that's kind of how my values just transcended into like respecting a culture. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. My, my head's all over the place right now. So I'm trying to like, <laughs> Tra- track back into time and like where all this started. Cause I'm, I'm like it, at the moment I'm looking through like old footage from when I first got my video camera and it's just like, it's a cluster. It's, it's insane. And I'm just trying to figure out, like I'm trying to make sense of my path and well, how it all came together. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Cause I know that when we first met like 10 years ago, you were already doing travel stuff on YouTube. You did, you walked from LA to San Diego, you rode, 29 mile an hour scooters across the United States. And then I just saw on, on your YouTube channel, you had dug out an old tape from 2004. So that's well, yeah. more, way, way more than 10 years ago. And you're doing a, a sort of narrative travel video there, pointing your camera at your face, talking about what's going on. So what compelled you to even start doing that? All right, we're going to go back here. Um, it's funny because I'm looking at footage from 2004. Um, all right, so here we go. My family had a video camera in like the early 90s, and we used that camera to capture some of our travels. And in turn, that camera became like our our school project camera, or like you know, my brothers and I would make stop motion videos. 
Um, it was just like a, a tool for us. So it was, it was a toy that we used and we just made all kinds of videos. Um, so, so filming was always like capturing stuff was always there, whether it was taking photos or video, it was something that was just like, it's what we did, our family. I mean, as, as did a lot of families, whenever you went on vacation, you brought whatever camera you have to document that, that experience. So it's not like anything revolutionary about it. It's just what we did, but we took like a liking to, to the video camera. Um, but that was my family's, that was my parents' video camera. So once I got into college, uh, I didn't have a video camera, uh, but the kids around me did. And I knew some kids who like were studying, uh, film at the university. I was studying in, in Hawaii at the time and I was studying, uh, business economics. And I didn't know why I chose business economics. It was just like the safe path. I think I hit that point in my life after high school. It's like, well, what am I going to do? I got to find a career and I don't know what I'm passionate about, even though the passion was there of filmmaking, but I just didn't, it wasn't tangible being a filmmaker. It just like, it just seemed way out of my reach. And I didn't even understand like, or know which route to go uh, for that. So after I graduated college, I think I expressed interest in, in, in just filming, you know, we were doing, I guess, jackass type of stuff during college. And this is around, you know, I think jackass in some ways kind of inspired me because it was like this amateur filmmaking technique. It's like, Oh, these guys just acting like idiots. It's not about the style or like the quality of the video. It's about the, it's about the subjects. It's about the, the content. So I was like, okay, well we're, we're idiots. I, mean, I was a big idiot, you know, you know, when I met you, you had a, uh, you had a watermelon on top of your head. So yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. I remember that. That was a very eventful uh, evening. And the camera was involved in that evening. And I believe I have like four more tapes to go until I get to that stage of, uh, of my, of my process right now, looking back through old footage. Um, so anyway, it was just like, it was about just capturing the moment and, and having fun. I mean, I have like photo albums from like the day I was born to, to today of just like of my life. I just love documenting things because I, I understood the value or the power of memories and nostalgia looking back to my parents, photo albums. Like I, I want, I want to have those moments captured so I can share them with my kids. Um, so really what happened was I got a camera after graduating college. And while I'm like looking for a real job, um, I, so yeah, I, I get this video camera. I'm working at Wrigley field, um, at the baseball stadium in Chicago, selling beer, uh, over the summer, uh, and also working like concerts in and around Chicago. And I'm, bringing my video camera around everywhere I go. And mind you, my brothers at this time are, and you know, my brothers, Paul and Dan, that's how yes. we met. Uh, they were riding their bicycles across the United States of America. So they're riding their bicycles, like, you know, actual bicycles from Oregon to Jersey. So I, I'm staying home in Chicago with my video camera, working at Wrigley field, making just like just ridiculous content, not knowing what, what I'm going to do with this content. I'm just like capturing video for the sake of capturing video. And people around me had no idea what I'm doing. I'm filming people in bars. And I was like, what are you doing? What's the purpose of this? I didn't know. You know, I just knew there's like, there was something there. Um, and this story might make sense down the line. Uh, so then, uh, you know, I'm filming this stuff and then I'm capturing these moments of me working at Wrigley field. Um, and then my brother comes back from his bike trip, my oldest brother, Paul, and he invites me to go to Europe for the Olympics. So I got this brand new camera. I'm filming everything as people do when they get like a new piece of technology, like a video camera. Uh, I'm using it all the time. So I bring it to Europe and I'm just capturing everything in Europe. I'm, you know, recording all of our experiences, the people we meet, my brother and I just, you know, traveling. And I don't know if there's something like deep down inside that I wanted from this, but like growing up as a kid, I was a, just a huge travel fan. Like I love travel videos. I, I would watch whatever was on TV, whether it was like LB Mangles and he was, I don't know if you're familiar with LB Mangles. He's an Australian filmmaker who brought like this like ridiculous, uh, camera on like his sailing journey around the world. And like, there's no story to his adventure. It was just a dude who like left civilization, grew out a beard and lived on a boat and like traveled to exotic places around the world. There was something so captivating about that. And I didn't know how I can do that, but I think somewhere in all this, in my DNA was like, I want to be Albie Mangles. And yet I had like this little tiny Sony, but technology and the resources were more available to me than they were to Albie in the sixties and the seventies. He had to have like this big, like $200,000 rig and, you know, feed in tape and, and capture his, his story. So I was like, I don't know if that was like my, my motivation, but I, I just kept filming everything. And during this time I'm in, Chicago, so I, so I go travel around Europe, I come back. And then this is like a part of the story that I haven't told anybody. Um, and maybe it's cause I was ashamed or I just didn't want to admit it. 
But I'm going to tell you now uh, because I'm going to make a video on this soon anyway. So I might might as well get it out there for the public. Yeah. So I, um, I was a male model for like a couple years. Um, so I'm living in Chicago and I'm going on auditions while working at Wrigley field, pretty much neglecting like the, the pursuit of working downtown Chicago at, uh, I don't know, a, a consulting firm or whatever. I just didn't even use my, my resume, my college degree. I just went like, okay, I'm going to work at Wrigley field. I'm going to make money and I'm going to travel the world. I'm going to find a way just to fuel that passion, which was travel. Travel was always there. I always wanted to just find a way to go somewhere. I mean, that's why I went to school in Hawaii. I escaped Chicago because of the temperature and like, how can I, you know, combine education and travel together? So I got in this world of modeling, I guess I'm going on auditions. Um, and then that kind of led me to New York city. So after the baseball season was over, I moved to New York city Um, so it's like September, 2004, YouTube's not out yet. Really. If you're going to publish or promote anything at this time, it's like MySpace or, uh, I don't know what was else. It was Reverie even out back then. A blog, maybe a a blog on blogger.com. That's where I started my, that's when I started my blog on blogger was 2004. Okay. Yeah. So blogger was around. So, you know, there's, there's definitely resources. Yeah, exactly. And I was 2.0. I guess it was was pretty close to 2.0 anyway. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I'm in New York and I'm documenting my experience in New York. Meanwhile, like going on castings and all this stuff. Um, and then that, you know, after that, then I ended up from New York getting sent out to Milan in Italy. So this is now like 2005 We're like three months in my mind. I'm creating this timeline, like relative to YouTube and when YouTube came out. So it's like 2005, I'm in Milan, I'm doing show season. Um, and this is like women's fashion week. Cause I'm still like a new face. I have no like credentials. I don't have much of a book. Uh, I have some photos, uh, some test photos and some stuff from a job. Uh, so then I'm, I'm doing a couple shows in Italy. I'm getting paid. Um, doing like showroom stuff, which is like after show season, you're sitting around in your underwear and like clients from around the world come in. They're like, Oh, we want to see that suits on that guy. Then they like, Wait, what's, what's show season called? I mean, what uh, well, is show this, season about? Uh, this is called showroom. So this is after after show season. So like sh- show season is like runway, pretty much. Sorry, the, the gotcha. terminology. Yeah, I'm not yeah. in the industry. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. Not, I, mean, like, I haven't I'm, modeled. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you can do spirit modeling. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So it's like okay. So show season is like fashion week, which is runway stuff. So. I did a couple shows during female fashion week. So it's like 20 girls and then like sprinkling in three dudes and dressed up with like a scarf and a weird jacket and funky pants. And I'm, I'm walking down the runway in Milan. I'm like, this is, this is cool, man. Like this is, this is interesting. It's not like a lifelong dream, but it's like, I'm getting paid to be here and walk down a runway. Um, I did a commercial with a beer company called uh, Nastro Azzurro, which is an Italian beer company. I remember Nostro Zero from when yeah. I lived in Italy. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's pretty much their national beer. Um, I booked that job. It paid pretty well, but then they canceled the shoot because the lead actor um, didn't have his passport. So they thought he was an American, but he was actually from Nigeria. So he carried a Nigerian passport. So when he tried, when he traveled from U S to Italy for the shoot, they canceled the shoot, but I still booked the job and I showed up on set um, because the scene that I was in was canceled, but I still got paid which was cool. Like I didn't even have to do any work, <laughs> but during this time I'm, I'm capturing all this stuff with my video camera. Um, I'm, I'm capturing the behind the scenes of the fashion week and I had a great time, but I kind of lost myself there. I, I had no direction. I didn't want to be a model. Uh, I was drinking and just like kind of using that as a way to explore Italy. And I remember one moment, well, many moments actually, when I was just trying to figure out what to do in between castings. Cause like, keep in mind, castings during show season is insane. You're going like 10 castings a day. You go to your agency and this is before smartphones, you know, they give you a printout of all your auditions, your castings, and you're going from one place to another. And you're just hanging. It's like, you go into a room just filled with dudes. It's just like a room full of like the best looking dudes in the world. You're like, Oh my, I have no chance in hell. You're going to pick 10. There's 200 dudes, like guys waiting outside the, like impossible. So I'm kind of like in this weird bubble. I'm just like, everyone's judging you. And like, you have not, no one cares about anything you say at all. It's about how you look. So you're just kind of sitting there, <laughs> pouty face, you walk up, you show your book. And then you're like, uh. and I remember during this time, like kind of goofing off with this. Like I remember going to an audition one time in my underwear and having my friend film it. Cause I'm like, I just, I need to break out. I'm like, I, in, in essence, I'm an entertainer. And right now I'm just, I'm a model. Like I, an aspiring model. I was like, this is driving me nuts. 
Um, so during this time, I'm like in between castings, I'm going to this bookstore uh, near the Duomo, which is like in the center of Milan. And I'm in the travel section. I'm just looking through travel books and I wanted to get out of Italy and, and I wanted to get out, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to fly home. You know, when you tell people, it's like, okay, I, I came home from Italy. Everyone's going to assume you flew home, right? If you, if, if I told you right now, I'm like, Oh, I just, I just came back from Italy. You're, you're, you're probably going to think, okay, well, how was your flight? And I think part of me was just like, I want to get back home, but I want to do it in a very unconventional way. I want to travel home overland. So I'm in Italy. I'm like, okay. So I'm, I remember just looking at these guidebooks and these maps and be like, I can go across Russia, cross the Bering Strait somehow, go through Alaska, down through Canada, and then like knock on my parents' <laughs> door in Chicago and be like, hey, I'm here. It's like, how'd you get here? Be like, I traveled by train, by boat, by car. And it was something that's so exotic or just so like amazing feeling that I could just be like, I can start my journey right now. I don't have to start my journey by jumping on a computer and finding the cheapest flight. I can go to the train station and be like, get me to Hamburg or get me to Moscow. And then from Moscow, get me there. Unfortunately, this didn't happen. And I remember just like writing in my journal, my diary, about like having this dream of like just owning a really comfortable pair of boots, a very nice warm wool sweater, a beautiful rucksack, and just saying goodbye. Because I live in this very pretentious, like just silently judging world where it's just like, are you pretty enough? Are you cute? Are you cute? I'm like, this is not me at all. So I kind of escaped the industry. I, I said, see you later. After I did that Nostra at Zero thing, I, I cashed out, made some money. I was like, all right, I'm going to go back to Chicago. Um, so during that time, I'm like, okay, what, what's the next step in my career? Uh, so then I went back to Chicago. I was working at a factory and then I was working at, um, Wrigley field again for the second season. I actually did a uh, second season with my brother, Dan. And during this time, like, I think YouTube came out in April, right? April, 2005, I think it is. My brother, Paul joins YouTube and, um, you know, he's telling me about what this site is all about. It's like, it's a video sharing site you can use, you know, you can upload some of your videos that you've created. Um, but I didn't know what to upload. So I waited like four months until I joined. Um, but during this time I'm still capturing video. And I remember one time, okay. So like a little short story here working at Wrigley field. Um, it's pretty much, it's a union job. So you can go in whenever you want. And, uh, before you go in, you get assigned a, a number every single day. And then based on that number, uh, you kind of, you line up in a, in, in a row and then you wait to see what products are available to sell as a seat vendor in, at the, in the stadium. So that one day they like assigned me jumbo hot dogs. And normally I always got beer, which was like unheard of, but like the Cubs had come off like a really amazing season. So like they, just a lot of fans were in the seats. So they needed to sell beer. Um, and cut me off by the way, if I'm just speaking too much. Uh, uh, so they ended up giving me jumbo hot dogs and I remember just laughing it off. I'm like, that's I'm how you became it. jumbo dude. Is that what you're saying? It's, exactly. That's how I became jumbo dude. So, you know, I don't know if it, 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 I was telling you before, like I, I always wanted to be an entertainer. So like maybe modeling was a step in that direction just to kind of get comfortable of like being judged in some way or exposing yourself. Um, so either way I'm, I'm at Wrigley field. I'm selling these jumbo hot dogs. So you got like this, this heater thing with all these hot dogs and like your lap is just on fire. And I remember like walking up and down the seats, just pretending like I was Russian. So Russian, Polish, or whatever. I just like threw on like a really generic Eastern European accent. I was like, okie dokie, jumbo dude is here. Who needs a dog? Jumbo dogs. Okie dokie. And everyone's like, you know, they, they would, they get a dog and I would like sit down and talk to them and just chat it up with this really bad Eastern European accent. They're like, well, where are you from? I'm like, I'm from Chicago. And I'm like, no, where are you from? I'm like, I'm just messing with you. I'm from Chicago. And they're like, oh yeah, you, you had me. I thought you're like Eastern European Russian or something like that. So this whole day goes by, I'm just like chatting with fans, selling hot dogs with an Eastern European accent. And I think this moment, there are these kids who were following me around the stadium, like 10 year old kids. There's like six or seven of them. And I, I remember them just chanting my name going jumbo dude, jumbo dude. And they, they like followed me down to like the lower concourse or like the lower seating area. And the usher told them like, stop, stop. You can't, you can't come in here. They're like tracking me down. Like I was some sort of celebrity or something. And I just took, I, I just, I, I thought this was hilarious. This was, I don't know. I remember the, as I, as this was happening, there's a kid that was sitting near me that I went to high school with. And he looked at me, he's like, Pete Bragill, what are you doing? And he hears me with this Eastern European accent. Like what is going on? Uh, and I remember going up to those kids and they're like, jumbo dude, jumbo dude. And 
they, they, they gave me their tickets to sign and all I had was a mustard packet. So I took a mustard packet and I signed jumbo dude on their, on their tickets. So ever since that moment, I became jumbo dude. That was like my, my character. So at, after that, I started making videos under the guise or like the character of jumbo dude. My production company to this day is still called jumbo dude productions, uh, as a little nod to my, 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 my story. Um, so then YouTube's out at this point. I'm making a video called like Jumbo Dude News where I'm up in my parents' attic and I, I talk about how I'm going to shave a Chicago bull in the back of my head. So I end up shaving a Chicago bull. I go to like this Chicago barber shop and I make this video and, you know, it gets a couple hundred views or a thousand views or something like that. I'm like, okay, there's something here. There's something here with this video and sharing and YouTube thing. So I continue to make more videos um, while I was working at Wrigley Field. And uh, I guess the rest was history. I was just like, just trying to find funny things to create. And I eventually made, you know, music videos. Um, I mean, the story goes, goes but they on eventually and eventually became travel videos. Like I know that when I first met you and you're, you, you, you did the, it was a walk stars series is what you called it. You walked from LA to San Diego. Then you did the scoot stars. That's the thing that was like, really blew my mind. It was really crazy is that you got these, these scooters that could go 29 miles an hour. And then with your friends rode from what, like Los Angeles to New York. Yeah. LA to New York. And then documented it. And you had like a, a really interesting way of, of, of doing it too, because you allowed people to vote as you updated it to, to, to decide where you would go next right. uh, on your journey. Yeah. So I, I guess how we got there was, um, after baseball season and after, you know, and making jumbo dude type videos for like a year, I ended up moving to Los Angeles to pursue a career in acting. Um, so I'm here in Los Angeles and my brothers moved up to San Francisco to kind of, you know, to start, well, they had their company that they started in Chicago and they moved it to, uh, to San Francisco. So we, we all made this trek out West. I was out in Los Angeles there in San Francisco. And again, going back to the whole modeling, like being judged thing, I remember going on auditions, uh, in, in Los Angeles, booking a couple of things, but just like not being in full control. And I'm a very hyperactive person. If I'm not working on something, I got to find something to work on. So I'm like, if you're not going to choose me, I'm going to choose me. And I'm going to pursue my dream. And that is being a travel show host. I mean, really and being an much- actor is just like, it's a step up from being a model in terms of control. Cause you have some choices that you can make and stuff, but ultimately you're still kind of following somebody else's script and somebody else's direction. Exactly. And, and, and during that time I was making, you know, I, I did more modeling too. I did like, uh, this is probably like the funniest period of my, my life was like, I did an Ed Hardy and Christian Audige fashion show in Los Angeles. I'm like, what, what am I getting myself into? So I think I found like solid, like solace in these videos and just creating stuff and being creative and not walking down a runway with Ed Hardy gear. You know, like I don't, I don't have anything against that style, but I'm just, it just wasn't me, but yet I'm representing that brand. So I want it to be me. I want it to be more of me. So that's why I started making those videos, but I'm making these like sketch comedy videos. Um, but then I realized like, I want to do something that's more episodic. That's more story driven. That's less about having to come up with a script or come up with like a, a jingle. So I started making these, these, you know, I get, I, I okay, sorry. So I, going back to like kind of how I wanted to travel overland back to the United States, I, it's been like a lifelong dream of mine to do a few trips. One was canoeing the Mississippi river, which I did a few years ago with my brothers. Um, one was jet skiing to the Bahamas, which I'm going to do soon. And another was walking across the United States of America. So having this like dream underlying all of this craziness that's going on, everything just kind of aligned. I'm like, well, YouTube's out. I, you know, I'm, I'm getting lots of views on these, on these videos. Like I have a platform. I don't have to go on auditions. Like I can be my own travel show host. I can create my own travel show. So I went up to San Francisco and I told my brother, I'm like, I'm going to drop everything. I'm going to walk across the United States and I'm going to film it. I'm going to, I'm going to upload it every other day. I'm just going to upload whenever I get internet connection. Cause all the line, all the stars are starting to line. Like, wait, you can upload on the, on the go. Like you don't have to be in a city or in a place. Like just as long as you have internet, you can, you can pretty much work remotely. Um, so then my brother was like, he, he advised me, he was like, don't, don't commit to walking across the United States. Maybe you just like do a little test walk, walk from LA to San Diego. It's like, okay, that sounds perfect. So then we came like up with a lean series startup. Uh, yeah, exactly. Before the lean startup. <laughs> yeah. So we did, uh, so we did the walk from Los Angeles to San Diego and we uploaded videos every single day and we want to create this. I mean, I, I have a flyer 
that like we would send around to people. We just like go on campus, send people flyers and it'll be like the walk stars walk from Los Angeles, San Diego, 130 miles. Join us. The revolution must be video blogged. And I was like, like at the time it's like, okay, we got to video blog this. We got to film it every single day, get a hotel, edit the video and upload it. So that way there's like a semi real time experience. There's something about that engaging element where people can come walk with us and meet us on our trip, uh, which kind of spilled over to the scooter trip. Uh, so there's something about just that connectivity of like, okay, creating compelling travel content or just any content for that matter. Um, and then yeah, just communicating with our audience. And then, yeah, that, that's kind of how the whole travel thing got going. Cause then I just found like this comfort and I was like, this is it. This is what I love to do. There's like no shortage mm -hmm. of ideas. If I want to go on a trip, I can bring my camera and capture it. And it just, it's weird how everything kind of came full circle. That's like, this is something that I was doing for a long time. I just didn't know because there weren't, there weren't avenues to like make videos and put them somewhere. It was just like, you made videos, you put them in, you kept them in your like cassette box and then you showed it to family. But how do you show it to the world? And this is my, like, that was my moment. I'm like, I'm just going to do travel videos from now on. I'm seeing like a lot of, uh, sort of disparate interests that eventually converge. You know, you were, you were making these videos. You could hardly help making these videos. You were doing a lot of traveling and started making videos while traveling. Then you're doing kind of like playing around with modeling or entertaining or being an actor. And there were certain elements of all these things that, alone didn't necessarily equate to something but when they finally converged then you sort of found yourself in this place where you can do these things like you're doing with rosetta stone where where you're you're building something according to your own values but you're still not you're not having to compromise really you're still in control yeah well said, Ben. Yeah, I feel like you summed everything up. It took me like 35 minutes to, to cover all that. <laughs> um, so when you were first putting stuff on YouTube, was was there any sort of shipping resistance there? Was it hard to get yourself to 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 complete a video and, and, and put it up? Yeah, I mean, the, the capturing, the filming, everything was easy. Taking an idea and then like making it tangible was easy. Um, but because you had done it so much before, right? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, well, making the video is easy. I feel like editing the video, all that stuff. I had the, I had the software, I had the, the program. So it's like there weren't any like barriers or like limitations to making the video, but releasing it was the hardest part. Cause it's like, I'm at this stage in my life that I should be a professional in my mind. I should be pursuing a career. And YouTube wasn't established enough where you told people I make YouTube videos and they, and, and people give you respect. I, I'd show people a video like, what are you, what are you doing? What is this? And I'd be like, dude, this is awesome. It's got 23,000 views. And they're like, okay. And then there's like this, I don't know if there was a shame. I just felt like I was letting people down Whether it was like families, these voices in my head and being like, I'm going to release this video, but what does it mean? What's the end goal? Why am I doing this? I knew why, because it was fun. I was laughing. My, my brother and I, Dan, my brother and I were just making videos, just cracking up. You know, like we made a video called Jumbo Dude Rollerblading Bandit. It didn't make any sense, but it made sense to Dan and I because we were just I love being that crazy. video. Oh, thanks, man. And it got featured on YouTube in like November of 2005. It got featured on the front page of YouTube. And I remember us showing people and they're like, you know, our friends who had like real jobs, whatever that meant. And they're just like, okay. And they didn't say anything, but it was like the silent judgment. And it's like, maybe I was just so like aware. And I'm just like, okay, maybe I, I shouldn't be posting this. So every time I would make a video, I had these like, I don't know. These, just these, it was like this conflict of like, do I release this? Okay. So I remember in a lot of these videos, I never swore. I wanted to make sure I didn't like let my family down or just like, because there was no, I guess there's no, there's no objective to this. There's, I mean, if people knew that I was making money, like I am now, they'd be like, do whatever it takes, man. Back then, I know I had a lot of, I had a lot of forces I had to fight. We're going to take a quick break. I want to talk to you about your potential. I want to talk to you about the work that is inside of you, just waiting to come out. I know how it feels. It's how I felt when I was sitting in a gray cubicle in Nebraska 13 years ago. What did I do? I opened up a browser and I started a blog. It was my playground. It was where I practiced my web design skills and my writing skills. A year later, I had a job in Silicon Valley. Six years later, I had a book deal. If you want to reach your potential, you need a place to play. That's why I put together a tutorial, a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to register a domain, get a host, and set up your very own WordPress blog. It's easy, and I've laid out all the steps with clearly marked screenshots. 
Just go to cadavy.net slash blog tutorial, blog tutorial, that's all one word, to find my step-by-step guide on starting your very own blog. That's cadavy.net slash blog tutorial. I can't wait to see what you create. Yeah, what about when you ended up in Los Angeles and you're, you were experimenting with the sort of traditional actor route where you're really just trying to appeal to gatekeepers all the time? What sort of reactions did you get from your actor friends about your YouTube videos? Oh, yeah, good question. Um, they didn't see it. Um, some, some got it. Like my friend Josh, uh, who walked me to the walk stars, he got it. You know, there are people that I approached. I'm like, hey, do you want to walk with me to San Diego? Um, and I don't think they saw it because there wasn't, there's was nothing tangible. There's nothing like immediate about making videos on YouTube. It's like, cool, it's on the internet, but it's not TV. And you'd have to have like amazing foresight to see that like brands are going to come in and like money's going to be pouring online and you're going to make money on this medium. So people, the, the traditional actors, they didn't see it. It was all about like getting the right headshot, getting the right casting agency as, or getting like the right friends who are in the industry. Uh, it, uh, there's a couple moments that I keep bringing up or that I keep reminding myself about. I remember this one time, like I was making cosmic drug dealer. It's a music video about like this Martian who takes uh, a hit of like Pluto ecstasy. Another great video. Uh, thanks man. So I'm, I remember like being, uh, staying in this, uh, I'm sharing an apartment with a few actors and I'm, everyone's going out this one night. Actually a lot of nights people are going out and I'm staying home learning after effects, trying to figure out how to make this video come to life. I wanted to like, pop like a 3d 3d pill. And then like, it goes in my mouth and it goes into like this psychedelic video, but I didn't know how to use after effects. So I had to teach myself after effects. So I'm in Los Angeles, like editing this video. And I remember one night I went out eventually, like finally going out and like one girl tell me, she's like, Oh look, it's Pete. Like he's, he's finally out. He finally got out of his cave and she didn't mean anything of it. She wasn't trying to be like insulting, but like, I, I took it like, wait, like, you know, I'm, I'm a friend. I hang out, but it's like, they looked at me like that's Pete. He's like, he's, he's, he never goes out. He's doing that. And I, I remember because I put so many hours just trying to learn something and there weren't many resources at the time. Like you couldn't go on Linda to like figure out how to learn some of these programs. There so there's a like, lot of YouTube tutorials. Or- yeah, exactly. There, there are definitely sites. I mean, I'm not, this isn't like internet 1997, you know, like this is 2005 There's definitely resources. So I used some of those resources and like taught myself some things. Um, so I think there was like definitely some pushback from like my actor friends. Cause I wasn't, you know, I was still going the, the uh, I guess the traditional route, but I just was doing this on the side um, and I think now some of the people get it, you know, now they see, or I, I, you know, I, I see a lot of these people that move to Los Angeles, they already have a social media following. They already have Instagram followers. They already have their own platform. So I think some of the older traditional, uh, thinkers are just like, okay, now how do I do that? And yeah, so, that's, so that's when you that. were talking to them about your YouTube videos and, and they didn't seem to get it, was there any part of you that was like, gosh, don't you, don't you see this you you were talking about the foresight did you have some of that foresight or at least inkling of it i did i mean i I look back at some of my journals or even like my text edit docs that i wrote way back when and i'm talking about like it's funny because i I read this a a few days ago and it's from like 2006 maybe and it's about a language travel show and i'm like oh yeah incorporate a language and go on this travel show and it's crazy to see like eight years later or whatever 10 years later that like that actually came to life. Wait, so tell me more about this. Do you, do you just sort of, how do you operate in your, in your notebooks or your journals where you have ideas like that to, to look back on? Um, so yeah, I just open up a text edit file and just write random stuff where I, you know, I'd also have a tent, like a physical journal. Um, but just all kinds of ideas that would come to mind. I mean, I have like company ideas, um, that I've like on, on sketch pads. So I have like bins of just random ideas of like, TV shows, uh, feature films, you know, they're not scripts. They're just like ideas, just random ideas. Um, yeah, just wherever I can find anything to write on, I would, it's on my phone. I have like, okay, here's a video about a internet Rasta cafe. It's run by a Rasta man. Who's got like a dial up. Well, yeah, yeah, it's, it's funny though, because I think that a lot of people, they, they have ideas go on in their head and they get fixated on one. And then the fact that they're not doing the idea makes them feel some anxiety and makes them feel like, Oh, I'm not really accomplishing anything. Um, but there's something about living through the idea in your journal to, to like think of all the different contingencies and all of that stuff to actually that, that I find really helpful myself. Do, does that resonate with you at all? 
Um, I don't know. It, it's, it, it just helps to get the idea out there. And I think by doing that, it's just like taking that one step from, you know, in, in creation, it's all about steps. I think the problem is we start thinking about like the end goal more so than all the steps that it takes to get to that goal. So it's like the first step was to take it from here, from, from my brain and just put it down somewhere in, in the physical space. Cause like, this is like a lot, I don't know, this is, this is fantasy world in my head. There's nothing concrete about anything that's in my brain, just colors and like weird synapses and ridiculousness. So I'm just like, put it down on a sheet of paper, make it into a word, just start shaping it. You know, it's like, Oh, like you're making a bowl or you're sculpting something. You take just like a, a blob of mud and you're just like, just put it down, do something with it. So it's like, I feel like having all those ideas just helped like organize the ideas in my head. Cause before they're all just kind of floating around. There's no storage, but if I put them down on paper, then it's like, okay, these are, these are more concrete than the other ideas I have in my head because they made it to paper. So it's like the, the first step in the creation process. And then I, I look at, you know, I look through my notes and I, you know, just scan it through them. Or as I'm like flipping through my legal pad, I, I skim through an idea that I had a couple of years ago. I'm like, Oh, that's actually, that's, that's relevant. I can make that now. So once the um, idea is recorded in some form, you, you aren't fixated on it. You just sort of like let it sit there. And if it returns to you, you revisit. Is that how that works? I think so. Absolutely. Cause like now that we're actually talking this through, I, I remember like in my journal while I was in Italy saying how I want to travel and how I want to like, just get off and just walk. And like, I didn't, at that time it wasn't like, I'm going to be, I'm gonna have a show called the walk stars, you know, but it was just like, I, I, I just let it be known that like, this is what I want. These are things that I want at that period of my life. So I think, yeah, just having that stuff out there just like slowly manifest into essentially what I always wanted. Was there ever a time when you, when you didn't do that journaling, when you didn't do that recording of ideas? Um, yeah, I don't do so much of it, um, anymore. And maybe it's because it's like, I, I feel like I'm on a path now. I'm just kind of going through the motions. Um, yeah, I, pretty much after the scooter trip, I stopped writing in my journal. I don't know what it when was. Do you, when do, do you know when you started? Um, yeah, I think it was like, uh, it's pretty much after I graduated college this whole time that I'm telling you about, like after, uh, like when I started working at the baseball stadium, um, you know, I, I feel like I was thrust into this world where it's like, now I got, now you got to figure out Pete, you had all these excuses before of college and just like, Oh, it's, you know, it's going to come to you. It's going to come to you. And I would always say like, Oh, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. And like that time came where it's like, well, things got to start happening, dude. So I think I just gravitated towards a journal and just be like, I remember writing in these things being like, Oh, I didn't meet my future wife today. Like I didn't do this. And it was like, it was kind of negative, you know, I'm like, what, you know, I'm just trying to figure out what I'm doing. And I look back at it now, I'm like, dude, this is a very like optimistic time of your life. Like you, you can go in any direction you want right now. And I'm just talking about how I haven't done certain things. And I, maybe I was putting a lot of pressure on myself to try to find something to do, but that allowed me to just kind of release my emotions, I guess. And so I have a little bit of a hypothesis or theory about why maybe you don't write in your journal so much now. It could it be that there's almost like a hierarchy of the effort that it takes to make an idea happen. And you were getting the ideas out and then you were executing some of them. But now your path between your brain and execution is, is better carved. Like you can take... I imagine now when you picture a project in your head, you can picture like all the contingencies and make, and, and what are the, it, what are some of the issues that you're going to run into and like, how possible is it? Because you've repeated that process many times of imagining something, recording it in your journal, figuring out the steps to make it actually happen. Does that make sense? That makes absolute sense. Um, yeah. I, I, cause there was a time where like all this stuff was, it just seems so difficult to me. Like, how do I make a travel show as an independent producer? How do I make that happen? So I think like I needed to just like figure this out. I needed to jot down all these ideas. And I think, yeah, now it's almost, if I, if I do write it down, I have to work on it. And I like, if, if I do, if I do want, if, if I do want to write it down, it's almost, it's like, you, well, then you got to make it happen. So it, there might be that, but it wants to be like a little bit of a fear. It's like, if I, if I do it, then it's just going to like add to the, the priority list of other ideas that I, that I need to work on. That's interesting that you've, you've gotten to the point now where you feel like if you write it down, you kind of have to work on it. Is that, is that what you say? 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like if I write it down, I have to like fine tune it. And then it just, it becomes another like thing in my, in my head. I have like seven different shows that I want to create. And I feel like if I, if, if I add another like show idea, I feel like I have to like come up with a logo. I'll have to come up with like a synopsis of what it is. So it's like, I don't almost only just like block that out, but like, let's not go there. Let's, mm-hmm. let's prioritize. Let's, let's, let's create that trip. Let's produce that. Like I'm, I look at things, my wife tells me this all the time. So I, lo- I look at things like it's a stack of cards. So it's like, I, I work on this one. And then as I'm done, I work on the next one, as opposed to just like laying it all out and just looking at things and multitasking. I'm a very bad multitasker. I get like, so tunnel vision into something. So if I start thinking about m- other ideas, I know that's just going to like pull me away from like what my, my priority is. And right now I have certain priorities I don't want to interfere with. So like, let's just focus on these things. Cause these things mean a lot to me. I'll get to those other ones later. They're meant to be, they're going to be done sometime, but not right now. And I, and I'm, I'm okay with that. That sounds like a great attribute for being able to ship to ship. Yeah. I mean, I think that yeah. that's a huge problem for a lot of people is, is shipping is to take that idea and like make it into a thing. I th- and I think a couple of the mechanisms through which they fail at that is, is one, they, they, they dream this huge thing. And then that dream is so big and intimidating that they can't even like take it down to the little test, like walking across the United States and making a, you know, a show about it on, on discovery or something like that versus, yeah. okay, let's just walk 130 miles and, you know, scale it down to something that is manageable. I think that's one way that people prevent them, prevent themselves from shipping. The other one is the shiny object syndrome, which is the opposite of what you you seem to have. Um, which is um, you work on a project, you get seventy five percent done, you get through the fun part because the last part's the hardest. <laughs> oh, it's the worst. And then and then you get another idea, and then you just abandon that project. I. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm scared of that. I'm scared of like abandonment and and not seeing something through. And that's, you know, and I think what you said was great about just like being distracted. I know like I have some writer friends who like will have multiple script ideas, but it's like recently I was talking to one, he's like, he's just focusing on one and he's, he's okay with committing the time. It's like, this might take a couple of years. And I think as long as you like accept that, I think, you know, things start working out because we, like you said, a shiny object, you want it to happen right away. You want that instant gratification. Like I want that and I want it now. And you can't accept, you can't come to terms that like, it's going to take years. And I think you just have to like commit and like forfeit your time and be like, okay, this is just something you just got to work on. And, and it's going to happen as long as like you show up. I mean, it seems like the shiny object syndrome I always thought was just inevitable. You know, the, the resistance, I don't know if you're familiar with Stephen Pressfield's book, the, uh, the, uh, war of art. He talked about, talks about the resistance and that's a part of any creation of, of any creative process is, is this feeling of resistance, which will make you do, it will fool you into doing things like having shiny object syndrome. So, I mean, do you have any theories of, did you ever have shiny object syndrome? How are you just, is this just the way you are or did, is it something that you cultivated? Um, no, I, I definitely did. I mean, like I, I went into all this, like thinking it was going to happen right away, but it's like, ah, uh, I, I, I mean, I did like even doing the whole modeling acting thing. It's like, I, I kind of gave myself like timelines or like, you know, I'm like, if this doesn't happen by this point, then like, you gotta, you gotta do something else. So, and I think a lot of people do that. It's like, they want to like succeed right away. But I found that like, with this whole travel world, I didn't care how long it took because like the actual journey was really cool. Like I didn't care, like, cause I was living in the shiny object. I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm in Mexico. I'm in central America. I'm, I'm pursuing my passion. So it's like, I was already, I already attained it. And it's like, yeah, sure. There wasn't like, um, there wasn't money involved. There wasn't like big homes and cars. And it, it really depends on what your shiny object is. But my shiny object was, was a career. I'm like, now I can tell people, now I feel validated. Now, like I'm getting paid to, to do this. I don't care how much money it is. So it's like, it was just those little steps and like, you know, just get a little taste of this shiny object as, as you're going. And I think, um, I don't have it anymore because I feel like I'm, I've, I've already been kind of doing what I really love. And I think it's just about like maintaining that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're really rolling. I, I feel like, do you have like another half hour? Yeah, man. If, if you just let me uh, fill up my coffee so I can skip over myself a little bit more. Okay, sure. Can you take us kind of like from conception to actually happening, happening, what the process is like for creating one of these travel series? Yeah. 
You can talk um, about a specific one even. Okay. Uh, so the process, well, again, it's like, okay, I have a list of trips that I want to go on and it's really like, okay, which trip am I going to go on and how do I brand it? And how do I make it look exciting? You know, to how do, how do I inspire people just from the idea of, of what I'm going to do? Cause I'll tell people like, yeah, I want a jet ski to the Bahamas. Okay, cool. Um, but you are really doing that to, one, right? I'm, I'm going to, yeah. I, well, it's, it's like a, it's, it's a passion project I'm trying to, I'm trying to develop. So have you year. thought about how you're going to brand that one or how you might brand that? Um, yeah, I, I think it's just going to be as basic as jet ski to the Bahamas. It's not going to be like the jet stars or anything like that. It's, it's really just about like the, the visuals that I'm creating in my head. How do I want it to look? What message do I want to, do I want to convey w- with this trip? Um, and I think it's about, um, just kind of setting off and just like, you know, there, there are certain things that we do and there's certain things that we think we can't do. And I think something like jet skiing to the Bahamas just doesn't cross people's mind as something that they can do, even though the proximity is there. If you look on a map, it's like 50, 50 to 80 miles, wherever, maybe from the coast of Florida. It's like we're, 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 there's a small little ocean. So that just, you know, separates us too. So like, I'm just trying to figure out how, uh, to convey that message, be like, it's right there. Like if you look out from the shore, like you can see Bahamas. Why do I have to jump on a plane, waste a bunch of fossil fuel to like fly over there? It's right there. I can, I can just get there with the jet ski, you know, like just fill up with some gasoline and and go. Um, but anyway, we'll we'll go back to like a particular trip. Um, so yeah, I have an idea like canoeing the Mississippi river. Uh, let's, let's use that one for example. Um, one, it's like, how are we going to pay for this? They're like, how are we going to cover this? Who's going to come with me on this trip? Uh, and it's really just like telling yourself, okay, that that's the next trip. Like there's no other trips. Let's not focus on any other uh, productions. Like we're going to canoe down the Mississippi river. And this is a trip that I talked to my, with my brothers about for a long time. Um, so during, so like keep in mind, like all these trips are branded under my series called in transit. So it's like in transit, Mexico, Central America by public transportation in transit, the Trans-Siberian Railway in transit, the Mississippi River. So the branding's already there. The branding is just like, OK, it's in transit. It's me traveling from a point to another point. Um, so it's like, OK, we're doing the Mississippi River. It's like, how do we we need a boat? So then you just you really just start with like the most basic thing. If you're going to canoe down the Mississippi River, you're going to need a canoe. So then you go online and be like reliable canoes that don't tip. Uh, can, canoes that can hold, uh, 1500 pounds and you start doing your research and then you find canoe companies and you hit up the canoe companies, you know, just, just maybe the, maybe someone will give you a free canoe. You never know. Couldn't hurt to try. So then you reach out to a bunch of canoe companies. Uh, you know, some, someone, someone finally responds and gives you like a 40% discount. Like, okay, cool. That works. Uh, and then you gather all your resources and you just like, you go step by step by step. Like you don't worry so much about putting the boat in at Lake Itasca and then setting off. Like you worry about that months from now, but worry about just getting all the resources together. So you got your canoe. Okay. They're, they're manufacturing it in Canada. We need a canoe paddle. And then you do your research. I mean, you seem like a very well read person. You know what it's like to, to, to get into a bunch of a bunch of material and there's, there's no shortage of resources online. So chances are there's someone that's probably done this trip before. Like, let's see if they have a blog or there's some information out there. So wait, while you're doing this research, are you documenting it in in a Google doc or text file or what's Um, what's the, that medium? Yeah, I, I think this is, um, so my brother Dan was like crucial in this planning. So it's, it's very helpful to have someone, produce these trips with you just to bounce ideas off. Cause otherwise you're, you're in your head a lot. It's nice to just, you know, have some sort of communication. So my brother, Dan and I would just go back and forth on emails or Skype. So like we had like the saved emails about like, Hey, well, we should probably consider getting some, some water containers. And then someone would have another idea. We bounce back and forth, like, okay, well now we're hitting a weight limit. So it's like, it's like a startup company. It's like anything, like you are really just trying to figure out what, what you need within those limitations. Like, okay, cool. So now we know we got a canoe and we're trying to fill up this canoe with things that will help us survive to accomplish our goal of getting down the Mississippi river into the Gulf of Mexico. What do we need to make that happen? What resources are going to be available to us on the road? It's like, Oh, there's plenty of restaurants. Like we'll be able to get grocery shopping. Okay, cool. So now we don't have to, we don't have to stock up for like the apocalypse. We don't need like cans and cans of beans. Like we can get things as we go. So it's just like this dialogue that just like, you know, 
having with somebody else is, is very helpful. So, so that's kind of how that process went. And then it's like, well, I, I don't want this to be something where I film myself. I don't like that. I don't want it to be where you film me or I film you like we should get a cameraman. And it's like, okay, let's go on to Craigslist. None of my friends who are camera guys are available for this trip. So let's go on Craigslist and see who's available, you know? And it seems daunting, like you're going to go on Craigslist to find someone to take on a boat and be like, well, let's just take that step and take an interview. Let's just meet somebody. So we took some meetings, we met some people and we're like, this guy's cool. Like he's willing to do it. He's in a transitional stage in his life. He wants to go on this trip. And it's like super overwhelming. I'm like, this guy's going to come on our boat. It's three of us. If anything, he should be the one that's scared. He's going on a boat with three brothers <laughs> or on a trip with three brothers. Um, so then it's just like, everything just started like making sense. You know, at first it was just, it was all scattered, but we, we had our priority list, get all those things and get everything in order. So that way, when we actually get to Lake Itasca, Minnesota, everything's set up. All we got to do is just take a step and put the boat in the water, get in the boat. And then, then your priorities change. And it's like, okay, well now we got to make sure the batteries are charged all the time. Well, now we got to make sure we have somewhere to sleep tonight. So it's like, you're, just going day by day, just going with the punches. But it's like you set off with just like this very big, big idea. And then you just kind of funnel it into just like, you know, it's funny that you seems like you've prioritized the ideas in a way that, you know, knowing that there's certain decisions you'll be making while you're actually on the canoe and on the trip. But then there's other decisions that you decide to make beforehand or figure out beforehand. And, um, I mean, I kind of wonder mentally how you prioritize those. Like, are there some where you think, oh, well, if I do this, then that will actually motivate me to do all the other tail end parts of it. Does that I make think sense? so. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I think like by just putting yourself in there, it's like you, once you commit to it and I think it, like the, the hard thing is to, is to commit, like we're actually going to do it. And I having like, a support group like my brothers who are doing this trip with me. It's like, we all said like, we're doing this. So now we're all, we have to hold each other accountable. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but like it, it, it gave us like this opportunity. It's like, okay, well we're committing. We're, we're locking in a time. We're locking in a date. Like we want to do this this time because this is when everyone's capable. This is when Paul gets back from Africa. Like we can make this trip happen then. So I think then it was just like, it was this pressure. Maybe there's times where all of us were like, maybe we, we can back out, but it's like, we had, each other to hold, you know, one another accountable. So, um, and I think there's during this time too, we had like, you know, there was this fear of like, maybe this isn't going to happen. Maybe this is a bad idea. Maybe this is dangerous, but there's like a stubbornness amongst the collective. We're like, no, we said we're going to do it. Like we're set. So we have to do it. No one wants to be the one that said like, yeah, I don't, I don't know about this. Like, this is probably going to be too dangerous. Did you look around on any like forums and stuff to, he if there are people talking about that, they had done it? to see what uh, their yeah. experience were like. Yeah. There's, there's a couple guys. There's one dude named buck track. He, uh, he went on that trip and he, he went it solo. Someone else did a canoe trip by themselves, like in the eighties. So it was done and there are resources to kind of like hear about their story. So that was very helpful to know that someone else has done it and survived. And, and now, which is interesting. It's like, there are a lot of kids who are, or a lot of people who are tr going down the canoe and like, they're going online and typing canoeing down the Mississippi river and they can use our videos as a reference. And that makes me so happy. It's like, I, I was speaking to like a, a group of seventh graders and they like all had questions about, you know, my canoe trip. So it's like to, to open that door, like I, we use the resources of, of a blogger, you know, who had like a text file of like what, where he camped every single day, uh, how many miles he paddled, paddled. So we saw that it was, it was attainable. And now we pretty much just did the same thing he did. And I'll put it into video forms. So now people have, some sort of motivation and inspiration. And that's like, that's my big thing about making this stuff. It's like there, you know, we use this as a, as a way to inspire other people that like, you can be an idiot just like me and you can do it too. It's like, I have zero canoe experience. But like we made it happen. And like, this is something that's, 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 that's tangible uh, for someone else to kind of seek out. And, and it, that wasn't like a big branded trip, right? Uh, no, that, there was no brand attached to that. So what happened was I remember so my brothers have gone on some really crazy trips. They, um, so there was like a time when we were on vacation somewhere in, I think maybe Christmas time. And we're all hanging around. And my brother's like, we got to canoe the Mississippi river. This is my brother, Paul. And, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Like we're going to do it. But I, I didn't want to just canoe the Mississippi river without it being captured. Like it's got to look good. Like if I'm going to do this trip, it's like, it's, it's gotta be documented. It's gotta be like cemented. So that way like, 
down the line, my kids can watch or like there's some sort of legacy to this trip, not just like we did it. It's a blog or it's a couple of photos. And, and I remember wanting to get to do it a certain way. I want to like just amp up the production quality. Um, so I told him like, only way we're doing is if we get funding and Paul's like, I'll pay for it. I'm like, it's, uh, like it's gotta look a certain way. And I think there's some pride too with me. And like, I wanted it to be funded. I wanted to get, I, I wanted to, to raise the money for this. And, uh, around this time I, I got awarded uh, a grant from Google. Uh, it was like a YouTube next up thing. So they picked like 35 up and coming YouTubers and they gave them a grant for like $35,000. So this happened right before, right after like this, this point in my career where I was like, maybe I'm just going to stop making travel videos. It's like, there is no money that's coming from any of this. You know, it's like, I'm getting views, but there's really no money. So then Google kind of said like, Hey, here's some money. I'm like, perfect. That's the funding we needed. So then we took that money and I uh, used that to produce the uh, Mississippi river trip. And so I, I don't know if I would have done it if it wasn't for that, you know, I wouldn't have done it just being like, okay, let's go on another trip to like try to promote this series that I've been developing. Cause it's like, it just, it just seemed less and less realistic as time went on, like, you know, saving money to go on a trip. It's like, I needed some sort of validation from somebody else. And I think that came at the perfect time to like, just push me in that direction. So wait, you almost quit. Mm hmm. Yeah. I almost quit. There was, um, it's like, I remember communicating with a hotel group to do a trip in Southeast Asia. And we went back and forth for like a month. We're like, cool, we're going to do the Southeast Asia trip where Pete's going to ride around in a tuk-tuk and they're going to pay. And I was like, this is it. This is cool. And then last minute they, uh, they pulled out. They're like, oh, you know, we don't have the money in the, in, in our marketing budget to do this. So I'm like sitting around my home office. I'm like, uh, you know, I'm, I have rent. Um, I I'm unemployed. My wife is working. My girlfriend at the time, I'm like, what am I doing? Like, how am I going to get, yeah, I remember like trying to get funding from, or trying to get like, uh, trying to pitch this to travel shows or to, to travel networks. And just no one was interested. I'm like, what am I doing? Like, can, can I afford this lifestyle? Like it, it's expensive. I can't just make content, you know, with, in, in the travel world, I got to afford it. I got to pay for the flight. I got to, you know, have the right gear. I can't just make it in my studio. So it's like, it, it, there was that, that crossroads. It's like, do I just, do I do something else now? Like what, you know, how, how much longer can I try to shove this down people's throat? Like maybe there's, there's just not an audience for this. So yeah, it definitely was, uh, was on the verge of quitting and, I remember my buddy, the guy who came with me on the Mexico Central America trip, I was telling him about this YouTube next up application. He's like, just do it, man. Like you got nothing to lose. I'm like, I don't like competitions. I did not like the idea of being like, Hey, I need money. I'm Pete. Like I, this, this is what I do. This is what I'm going to do with the money. He's like, just, just do it, man. You got nothing to lose. And I'm so glad I listened to him because I, I did that. And I was just like, okay, someone else sees it, you know, like, yeah, there's viewers and there's people saying like, yeah, I like your video. Cool. There's hundreds of thousands of views, but it's like, th there's nothing, there's nothing monetarily about that. It's like, well, how am I going to survive? This doesn't, this doesn't feed me. You know, this doesn't like pay rent. So that, that grant from YouTube definitely just like opened my eyes. Like, all right, let's go guns blazing. Let's just keep going. And then after the Mississippi river trip, then it was a trans Siberian railway. And then it was a branded series with Land Rover. And it just, it just escalated. And it's just like all that momentum, you know, like just fed off each other. It was like, Oh cool. This guy got money from Google. Land Rover comes on board. Oh, he worked with Land Rover. Okay. Like let's work with him. And it's like nothing, nothing changed. Like I'm still making the similar content, but now it's just reputation. It's like, okay, he's worked with these brands. And it's like, I just needed that, that one little like kick in the butt or like that, that moment of validation to just like, I don't know, just keep moving. So you were, you were pitching brands for a while before the Google thing though. Did you have any success with that at all? Or was that just completely banging your head against the wall? Yeah, <laughs> pretty much banging my head against the wall. Um, yeah, I, I was reaching out to quite a few brands, but like people didn't get it. You know, it's like, what, why am I going to give money to a YouTuber? Like I, they just, there wasn't, there wasn't a business model there. Um, and so, I mean, I, I, I sensed that things were close. I was going to like these meetups in Los Angeles, like these new media video meetups. I don't know if you're familiar with tube filter. Um, it's just like a, it's, it's a news source for, you know, internet entertainment, whatever. And like going to these meetups, like you were talking to people and everyone's just like one day, one day, like money's going to come into this space. Like one day money's going to come. And you know, it was very hopeful. And we saw that there was something there internet like numbers online were, were growing, but the brands weren't there. Um, so it just, it, it just took time. I mean, yeah, I'd, I'd reach out to a bunch of companies, but nothing. Some of them might provide like 
free gear or whatever, but nothing like to the extent of what's where money is being invested in now. How does that process work for you now? Securing uh, the, your brands. Um, it's, it's still difficult. You know, it's, it's, it's a matter of like, kind of like we were talking about before aligning values, finding companies that, you know, probably speak the same language as you or, um, you know, have, have similar values. And it's just like, okay, what, who are companies out there that I want to work with? Let's just go on LinkedIn, send them an email, see if, uh, see if they have, you know, see what they're working on. Just like open up a dialogue. And it's just like taking that first step. I don't have an, an immediate plan. I don't have a trip in mind, but it's like, Hey, my name is Pete. I've done this and I'd like to do something with you, but I'd like to hear what you guys are working on. Maybe I can help you. It's not about me. It's like, I know you guys might have a hard time navigating this space. You guys have, you know, have a YouTube channel. I've been on YouTube for 12 years. Like I know a little bit about how things work. Um, so maybe there's, there's a connection and if not, whatever, cool, good luck. <laughs> maybe we'll work together in the future, but not to take anything, you know, to heart. And I think that's what got me back in the days. I, I, I was very emotional and like passionate about this stuff. If you didn't work with me, like you're on my list, like, Oh, oh just wait and see, I'm going to get you. I'm going to be big. And I was like, <laughs> you know, who cares? It's like, it's just, they're not ready for it. And like, I wasn't ready for certain things. Like it's all about timing. And you try to find people who are like, you just intersect and you guys are on the right path at the right time. And you make it work. And the only way to find that out is to actually like take the step and pull the trigger and do whatever, whatever that step is. Have you learned a lot about storytelling along the way in making these videos over and over again? Um, yes and no. I mean, like making them compelling the, the difference between the difference between just I guess uninteresting video and, and, and interesting video. Yeah. Uh, well, if you look at like my timeline of videos, you look at like the walk stars compared to, um, let's say the trans Siberian railway there, there's a big difference. And I think it came and, and, and I think that the shift came because of like a decision I made midway through, uh, when I was doing the walk stars, I was filming myself and my friends as we were going. So it's hard to tell like an overarching theme or an or overarching story. Cause we didn't know what the story was. It's like we're filming videos every day and then we're posting them every day. So like, what is the story? We know what our goal is. Our goal is to get to San Diego, but we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know who's going to get injured. We can't have that foresight. We can't like predict what's going to happen. Um, and, and, and you can't do that because you are in terms of shaping the story because you're uploading the videos day by day. So there's no storyline until like the trip is over and then everyone kind of connects the dots and then create their own story in their mind. It was like sometime in during the scooter trip, I'm like, I, I don't want to edit every single day and release a video because it's separating me from the actual story. So like, I think, but during the scooter trip, I was up uploading the videos as the trip went on. So there's really, I, I couldn't form the story because I already committed to releasing the video. So that, that, that part of the story was already out there. But then like the Mexico Central America trip came around where I took public transportation from LA to the Panama Canal. And I committed to like not editing on the road, not just filming it, capture the whole story and then shape it afterwards. So I think that's like where I learned about storytelling is like with travel. It's like, just do the trip, the story, as long as you have a goal, like you're going to encounter obstacles and things along the way that help you get to that goal. So it's like, you don't know what that story is until you actually complete it. And then in hindsight, you can make it, compelling. Do you think that you were able to actually do that and hold off on, uh, doing the editing as you go because you had previously done another trip where you made the commitment and then you were sort of obligated to do all that editing and doing that, do that, all that shipping along the way. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I think I needed to do that. I needed to, it, it, to experience that. So that way I knew that that's like a direction I didn't want to go because I knew there was, there was a, there was something lacking in those stories. So I just wanted to find out how I can make it a little bit more cohesive. Is there anything that you study about how to, how to find the story and make it more compelling? Um, no, I think, no, I mean, yeah, I'm not much of a storyteller. I don't think it's like, I'm just, I just live, you know? And I think life is, if you, if you commit to living an interesting life or doing something that's interesting, the story is going to happen. Like you just, you know, I mean, with some of these trips, like I didn't, there's no story. There's no like traveling on the trans Siberian railway. I just wanted to get to Moscow. It just so I can say I, I traveled across the entire length of Russia. So it's like the story is just like planting that seed that you're going to do it. And then just having faith that there's going to be a story along the way. I not I, Yeah. I remember you, you, it seemed like you were playing with a backstory in, uh, 
walk stars. I think I can remember one of your friends was saying like, Oh, I'm going on this trip because you know, I need to get stuff off my head. And then there might be a, a point where he's just sort of standing there staring off into space and you like wake him up. Yeah. And you know, it seemed like there was a bit of a backstory that you were trying to weave in there. Do you remember that? Yeah. Um, and I think th- the reason why is because a lot of people were asking us like, why, 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 why was the big question? Why are you doing this? And I didn't have an answer, never had an answer for why. And my answer was always because I can, because like, I just, because it's there, it's like, I, I can do it. And I, like, it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough for the industry, the people that I was working with, people I was trying to sell this show to, they were like, that's not enough. And I'm like, I don't know what the why is. They, they know? need the, they need the hero's journey. Yeah, right? exactly. They need, and actually, it was really interesting. I loved the part where you just said that uh, you, you talked about imagining going from Italy up through through Russia, through Alaska and all that stuff. And then you didn't do it. I mean, that's like a perfect, that's like yeah. a perfect hero's journey template. That is, you had a call and then you rejected the call. But then eventually, because that's the, that's the, that's the, the tension between the self and the ego is that yourself, your true self wanted to go on that trip, but there was something in your ego that was suppressing it. Yeah. And like that tension is what makes it an interesting story that you, you know, you, you wanted to do that. You fantasized about it. You decided not to. And then you went on to do all these other amazing trips. Well, yeah, I, it's that, I, that makes a lot of sense to me now. I mean, like, but I, I couldn't say that then. I mean, well, it, no, you it, couldn't it, because it, the, 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 you know, the, the story hadn't happened yet. Exactly. And I think with the walk stars, like there's a part in, there's a video it's called why it's like, why are we doing this? So like, I had to answer it. And it was like, I said, I wanted to have my own travel show. And like, it, it was as simple as that, but it's like, it wasn't as compelling of a story. It's like, cool. This guy wants to have his own travel show. So he's going to just make travel videos. But like, that's why I did that. And I, I, I guess I, I found someone like Josh who like found a reason to go on this trip. Like there's like some sort of meaning to this walk. And for him, he had, you know, just had a breakup. So he just needed to clear his mind. So like he was able to temper that a little bit, but like, I had no purpose other than like, I just want to make travel videos and like all these resources are available to me now. And I want to test it out. But do you think maybe there really was a purpose and you just couldn't see it then? that it was like a self actualization or like a, like an existential crisis. Like what would have happened? Like, what if you couldn't have, have done that trip? Yeah. What would that have felt like? Yeah, that's a good point. Cause it's interesting now, since I did that trip, I no longer have that dream of walking across the United States. Like I got injured. Like I have a bad leg. I got surgery. Uh, when I was like 16 years old, I have I had a tumor in my leg. So they removed like part of my bone in my shin. So like after doing this walk, I'm like, you know, this isn't for me. Like my leg just isn't, isn't cut out for this. So I don't have like that, that regret of like never walking across the United States. I don't want to do it. And so it's like, I, I almost needed this to like eliminate that from, from my mind. Um, but like if I hadn't done the walk, there'd, there'd be a lot of doubt. There'd be like, okay, there was something there that I needed to find that I didn't find. And it'd probably be looming over me for a long time. So I think like, I, I just had to do it just, I don't know, just because, just because yeah, it was there. It was like, cause you, cause you had no choice. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's interesting that you didn't walk across the United States. It makes me think about this idea that dreams can sometimes take a form different from what will actually fulfill you. Um, you know, I remember I used to have like a fantasy that I would uh, get a, a motor home and drive around the United States and I would just work through the internet. This is, you know, 12 years ago, just yeah. work through the internet and freelance. And, um, I didn't fulfill that dream in that form, but I've certainly lived and worked in various places around the world and been location independent. And I'm happy with that. So, I mean, I think that's just another one of like the dangers of dreams Yeah, is that sometimes your dream, uh, the thing that'll fulfill you can actually be in a different form than what the the dream really is. I think that's, that's great. If it's, if it's some iteration of that dream, like, are you in Colombia right now? Yeah. I live here now. Yeah. It's like, dude, like, if, if you were to tell yourself like, yeah, you can do a motor home or Columbia, you'd be like Co- Columbia. Intri- oh, that's, that's a good well, idea. Like keep in mind, know. at that point in time, I was living in Omaha, Nebraska. 
Yeah. And I guess I, I had done a, a, a study abroad in, in Italy before, but you know, just like getting out of Nebraska was, was this thing that I needed to do that I was scared to do and, and all that. So just to end up in Colombia would have been uh, out of the question. Cause it, it seems like you're being very realistic. You're taking the same step that I did about like, okay, I'm gonna scale it down and do like a shorter trip. You're like, well, I can, I can do a motor home around the United States. That's, that's tangible. You know, the States you you're, you're from there, but it's like the dreams evolve, the dreams evolve as, as do we, we grow. And then like, we have different aspirations. So I think it's, it's awesome. Just like have any dream, you know, it's like, it, and uh, allow it to change. Like, you know, not to be so stubborn. It's like, well, that has to be it. It's like, it, it, it can take on a form. And as long as like you have that burning inside your heart to go in whatever direction that you did when that dream first came up, then, then I think you're fine. Not to give anyone any advice. I don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Like, yeah, this, this, is, this is how to go about living, but just about pursuing something. It's like, just go in that direction and it'll take you somewhere else. There'll be a roadblock. Yeah, I think that that's, um, I mean, that's a, a a good place for us to start wrapping up, I think. Um, maybe this was the final message, but based uh, upon our conversation today, what do you think kind of the final takeaway or the final message is for our listeners who would, who would all love to fulfill their dreams in some way, whether it is traveling across, traveling around the world or, 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 or doing whatever, crazy fantasy they have it takes time it takes a lot of time and it, I'm, I'm sure if, if you listen to this whole thing which i thank you if you did is hour and 20 minutes of uh of chatting um i'm i'm still just as confused as i was you know i'm, I'm i have a lot of of ideas and i and, and i know that one thing that's like helped me is to just to do something different to do something as often as possible whether it's but as often as possible in, in pursuit of whatever dream I'm, I'm trying to achieve. So that's just this, write that one email, just like do that one thing that'll take you a little bit closer and like try to avoid what you were saying before the shiny object and just like, just, just do one thing at a time. And, and I don't know, <laughs> I, 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 you know, I guess like I was saying before, I'm still, I'm still confused. Like I'm, I'm trying to figure out what, what the next step is for me. I want to jet ski to the Bahamas, but it's like, how, how am I going to do that? So after we get off here, I'm going to like just figure it out. Nice. Yeah. Um, and where can people get more of you? Where do you want to send them? Uh, you can check out my, my YouTube page, uh, youtube.com slash P D R O P P drop. P drop. drop. Yeah, man. Or, uh, you just search my, you're name, not jumbo Peter dude Drake. anymore. No, I never was like, I never had a jumbo dude handle, uh, for anything, but yeah, you can go on my YouTube page and, uh, there, uh, I guess all my trips are pretty much consolidated into playlists. Uh, there's also some of the branded stuff on there that I did with, uh, some of the companies. So yeah. Right. Peter, it's been awesome having you on the show. Thanks so much for being so generous with your time. Of course, man. Thanks for having me. It was great to uh, catch up. Love Your Work is supported in part by Treehouse. Take your career to the next level and learn from over 1,000 videos created by expert teachers on web design, coding, business, and much more. Claim your free 14-day free trial at academy.net slash treehouse. You'll be supporting the show. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Peter Bregiel, and I hope it helps you follow your dreams, whatever form that they might take. For more on folks who have transformed travel into a career, check out Jody Ettenberg on episode 23. She was a lawyer. Now she's a food and travel writer. Find out how that happens. And if you appreciate all the work that goes into making this show, there are a couple of ways you can help support it. One is to subscribe, 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 subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Just hit the subscribe button. Another is to rate the show on iTunes. Just go to cadavy.net slash iTunes and click on write a review and click on the star rating. You don't even have to write a review. It just takes a couple of seconds. And do you like books? If you do, I'd love to send you my book recommendations. About 90% of them will be nonfiction on subjects spanning from biographies to neuroscience. Just go to cadavy.net slash reading, sign up, and you'll get my first set of recommendations right away. 
You'll be supporting the show if you buy any of those books through the links in the email. This has been Love Your Work, and I'm David Cadavy. The theme music for the show is More Streets, performed by Spider Flower. Love Your Work is a production of Cadavy Inc.